continue with a series uh, we started a number of weeks ago called Awesome God. And so this is the second part of it. Psalm 47 verse 1 says, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He's a great king over all the earth. You know, sadly, many believers are defeated, are depressed. You know, many people live lives of, of quiet despair. You know, not because they're bad or unspiritual, because God doesn't love them, but simply because they don't know that God is an awesome God. You know, they may know He's a good God, a loving God, a merciful God, but they don't know that He is an awesome God. And I think it's important for us to understand that because, you know, I really believe it's tremendously important because the moment you discover how awesome God is, it changes everything. Amen? Your mountains will shrink and your giants will fall when you see that the God you serve is an awesome God. Amen? You see, there is absolutely nothing that our God cannot do. How many of you believe that today? Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribes. Psalm 4.4, 4, Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your heart upon your bed and be still. Psalm 33 and verse 8, Let's, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Psalm 119, verse 161. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. <coughs> Excuse me. That word awe means to be startled by a sudden alarm, hence to fear in general. It means to be afraid or to stand in awe. It means to be in fear or make to shake. Amen. And I believe God wants to restore the fear of the Lord to his people. Because you see, if we don't fear him, why should we be surprised if the world doesn't? And, and that's what I love about the saying that he who kneels before, uh, before God will stand before men. Amen. So again, we must humble ourselves before the Lord. And, and so this revelation gives us stability, confidence, and peace even in turbulent and uncertain times. And truly, we are living in those times because again, wars or plague or pestilence or economic uncertainty or ideological conflict or even persecution. You know, we know that those things are coming because it's been prophesied. But you know what? We're not afraid. Why? Because we're members of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. How many of you are glad that you're a member of a kingdom that can't be shaken? Come what may, hallelujah. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. How many of you can say that today? My life is built on the rock of God's word. Jesus is my rock. Sam, uh, Hebrews 12 and verse 28 says, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. You see, our God is an awesome God because He is seated on the throne of eternity. Amen. And, I, I, you know, I believe Isaiah was given this revelation by God and he was forever changed. You know, Isaiah realized that though the kingdoms of men rise and fall, that our God is seated on the throne. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1 says, In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one cried to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Amen. So, oh, that the church would get a fresh revelation of how our God is high and lifted up. That's the first thing Isaiah saw. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Amen. That we would get that revelation that he is high above ideologies. He is high above philosophies. He's high above governments. He's high above the agendas and the plans and the strategies of men. Amen. That he is high and he is lifted up. High above the flesh. You know, he's high above all of the plans of men. You know, he is high above all of the things that you struggle with right now. So we need to bring it to him because he is the answer. Amen. Psalm 68 and verse 35 says, Oh God, you are awesome from your sanctuary. The God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. Blessed be God. 
Amen. So, you know, there is something supernatural even about coming to church, about coming into his sanctuary. Because, you know, firstly, God commands it. You know, Hebrews 10, 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But also, I believe, because he has promised to manifest himself among us in a very special way when we gather. Um, uh, again, Psalm 22, and verse 3, but says, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. The New Living says, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Do you know that God literally inhabits the praises of his people? So when we lift him up, it says he ha inhabits, he is enthroned upon our praises. You know, Psalm 18 verse 20 says, where two or more are gathered in his name, that he is there. So again, God has promised us that we can meet Him in a way corporately that we may not do so when we are on our own. So again, right now, don't miss the miracle of the moment. Don't miss the miracle of the moment of us gathering together in His name according to His word in Jesus' name. Where, where two or more are gathered, I am there. Because I believe this, there are many Christians who miss their moment. Amen? Uh, because either they're lazy and again, if you're uh, lying at home in bed today because it was wet and it was cold, you can watch and be blessed. But there's a special blessing about getting, get, you know, making the effort to come. You know, listen, uh, three, three weeks ago I was in Sicily. Last two weeks I was in Tulsa. You know, the, the weather, 25, 30 degrees. I did not feel like getting out of bed this morning. I, I had about four, four layers on. I was freezing. But I said, you know what? I'm going. And, and, and again, you say, well, you have to. You're the pastor. Okay. <laughs> I, I get that. You know, uh, <laughs> you know it's, like, it's like the guy was lying in bed and he, he, he said, I don't want to get up. And, and, and uh, he, his mother came in and he said, you have to get up for school. He said, I don't want to get up. And, and, and his mom said again, you, you have to go to school. He said, I don't feel like it. nobody likes me there. Nobody is kind to me. And, and his, his, his mother said, well, you have to go. And he said, why? He said, because you're the principal. <laughs> That kind of sums up some people, you know, just give me a reason. I'll stay in bed. No, you got to make the effort in Jesus' name. Amen? So, again, I believe some Christians miss their moment because they're lazy or because they're tired or because they're lukewarm or simply because they're distracted. Listen, if you're staying up till 3 o'clock watching TV or playing video games, don't be surprised if you sleep in for church in the morning, okay? But they don't realize that if they'd only gone to church, they would have received the answer, the anointing, the direction, the touch, the breakthrough that they so desperately needed. Amen? Amen? Uh, and, and again, Jesus said this in the book of Revelations, uh, book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and, and dine with him and he with me. This promise was given to the church. He's not talking here to an unsaved world. He's talking to the church. I'm knocking at the door. But some believers have the door of their heart closed to the Lord. And, and I find that, you know, I find that very sobering because earlier on in, in the same uh, passage, he said, I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were hot or cold. So then because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. I don't want to be a Christian that gives God a bad taste in his mouth. Amen. You know, the, the King James says, vomit you out of my mouth. I don't want to be like that. So again, he said, I knock at the door. If you open it, I will come in. What an invitation we have been given by, that, that we can come and sit and eat with the King of Kings. But let me say this. But as with earthly kings, there is a specific royal protocol that governs exactly how you approach earthly potentates. You don't just walk up to Queen Elizabeth and say, hey Lizzie, how are you doing? You don't do that. Somebody's going to smack you in the mouth before you get anywhere near her. Okay? There is a protocol. And, and you know, I, I understand that in many ways we're living in a generation where kings have been relegated to a mere ceremonial uh, position. But, but you know what? We serve a king whose throne is glorious and will stand for all of eternity. Amen? Because again, listen, with every king, there is a protocol. Esther knew this. You didn't just walk up to a king, not unless you had a death wish. Esther chapter 4 and, and verse, um, Esther chapter 4 and verse 10 and 11 says, But Esther spoke uh, to uh, Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. 
all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces um, that, are, that are here uh, <clears throat> know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the, the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So she said, this is the law. You do not approach the king's throne. Uh, uh, the, the, the law is they'll put you to death unless he extends his scepter to you. So again, there, there was a protocol. Um, you, you had to approach a king with a certain reverential fear. Nehemiah knew this. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, again, addresses the same thing. Nehemiah had a burden to, to rebuild the walls. And yet he, he also knew... Uh, you know that when, when you're dealing with a king, uh, you have to use wisdom. And it says, uh, I'd never been sad in his presence before. And therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you're not, um, since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. So Nehemiah understood, uh, you have to have a happy face around the king or, or he could remove your head from you. Amen. And um, so I think that's, that's important. So the, the king literally had the power of life and death. And therefore you have to give him the appropriate respect and honor. Now, these are just earthly kings, okay? But what about the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Where is the glory that is due to him? You know, maybe this is the reason for our relative ineffectiveness and spiritual importance. You know, m maybe this explains why we grovel before a lost world, begging them to come to church. We promise you it'll be over, you know, within an hour. Because the experts tell us, you know, people don't have the attention span for anything longer. Of course, that rule doesn't apply to cinemas or TV or internet or theater. It just applies to the church. We're the only ones dumb enough to believe that. Okay? So again, maybe this is why we grovel before the world is because we are not kneeling before God. So again, this is just the church. And I believe this is why in many instances you see churches getting up to all of these sideshow bob antics to try and get people into church. I mean, I've seen churches raffle motorbikes for people to come to church. You know, raffle holidays. You know, when I was in Tulsa, I drove past one church and said, this Sunday is bring your pet to church Sunday. I mean, listen, to me, all of that smacks of desperation. It smacks of desperation and it's also an indication of just how far we have fallen in our understanding of the greatness of the God that we serve. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. We serve a mighty God. We don't need to try and come up with all of these tricks and antics to try and get people to come to church in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. How about coming back to actually preaching the gospel? Thank you, Jesus. You know, we used to sing, what a mighty God we serve. But the question is, do we believe it? Do we actually believe it? You know, the fact is, I think we need to go back and sing some of those songs. Because sometimes you need to go back before you can go forward. Because when you study the lives of many of these great revivalists and preachers, you will discover, you know, that while there were varying ages, varying cultures, colors, personalities, giftings, there is one thing that they all had in common. And that was a holy, reverential, you know, fear of God. They had a reverence for God's presence. And they were given a, a, a revelation of the awesomeness of God and as a result of that they shook kingdoms and won nations for Christ. Sam 2 in verse 8 says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Amen. Ask of me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the othermost parts of the earth for your possession. Thank you. People, it is time for us to ask God for nations again. Because the Bible says there's simply a drop in the bucket in the eyes of God. Isaiah 14 verse 15, surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. The New Living says, no, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They're nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. This is how big the God that we serve. Uh, Psalm 25 and 12, it says the Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. 
the King James, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. You see, there's a realm of intimacy, power, and influence that we will only step into when we give the God, God the glory that belongs to him alone. You see, he is an awesome God and there is nothing that our God cannot do. Amen? Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Then I said, I pray, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of loving devotion with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to hear the prayer that I, your servant, now pray before you. Night and day for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we Israelites have committed against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. You see, Nehemiah was struck by the awesomeness of God. And God used him to raise up a nation from ruin. And you know, in the same way, Isaiah 58 and verse 12 talks about how we are called to rebuild the old waste places. Amen. God wants us, you know, he wants to use us uh, to, to rebuild the, the old way, waste places. Um, Isaiah 58 and 12 says... Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of streets to dwell in. You know, our streets are filled with plague. They're, they're, they're filled with, you know, broken homes and broken marriages and kids growing up without fathers. You know, you, you know, young people overdosing or getting involved in all sorts of sins that are going to bring destruction and heartache into their lives. And you see, as the church, we, you know, we have a part to play in, in restoring our streets. You know, we're called to be repairers of the breach. We're called to stand in the gap for our generation. The Bible says the Lord looked for an intercessor and he could find no one. Why? Because in many instances, we're so distracted and caught up with the things of the world that the Lord is looking for somebody who will be his hands and be his feet. Is there anybody today who wants to say, you know what, Lord, I, I want to take my place in Jesus' name. Amen? So again, we're called to rebuild the old places, rebuild our streets and cities, rebuild our hearts and our homes. But we won't do that until we re rediscover the fact that we serve an awesome God. A God who is high and exalted. A God who is still in control. So I'm just going to deal with the first point this week and we'll fin finish it next week. But I want to deal with this, the first point. Our God is an awesome God because He is awesome in holiness. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Our God is awesome in holiness. And it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says, Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Amen? And um, so, uh, part of living soberly, I believe, is, is getting rid of the beer in Jesus' name. Thank you for that complete silence. Um, Christ is coming, okay? And we must get our houses in order. You see, there's a cry that's going out in the Spirit. Can you hear it? Amen. Re Revelations chapter 12, you know, when John the Revelator encountered Christ in his re resurrected glory, it says he fell at his feet uh, as though dead. Amen. Uh, Re Revelations 1, it says he fell at his feet as though dead. Y you know, because the, 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 the presence of Christ was, was so strong and, and, and so glorious, um, you know, he, he wasn't able to, to deal with it. And um, so, again, it's important for us to, to recognize uh, the, the glory and the awesomeness of God. Because when, when we do, it will change everything. Amen. So uh, this is the thing. You know, personally, when I encounter Christians who support abortion or hold to so-called liberal values. And now that's an oxymoron if ever there was one. Liberal values. But um, I, 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 I realize they don't get it. Let me say this. God is holy. And he doesn't change his standards for anyone. He does, I the Lord do not change, Malachi 3 and verse 6. But you may say, but the times are changing, pastor. Yes, they are. It's proof that Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen. It's proof. You know, when people are trying to say a man can become a woman or, or vice versa, uh, it's, it's just an indication of the confusion of the age that we're in. 
It's interesting, just this last week, uh, they were interviewing um, uh, your man O'Rourke. He's a Democratic candidate for the presidency in the U.S. And they asked him, should, should churches who don't support gay marriage lose their, their, um, uh, their status, their, their, you know, the claim back to that, what's that called again? Charitable status. And he said yes. So again, you know, the, it, 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 they, they draw a line and they keep moving it. And, and so, you know, it's an indication of this demonic agenda that is at play. And so, hallelujah, God bless President Trump. And, you know, if that, if that triggers you, be triggered. I don't care. I really don't care. We're living in an age when people are afraid to say what they think. Walking around on tiptoes in case you offend somebody. Be offended. <laughs> Got to get over ourselves. Praise God for a man that's willing to be pro-life publicly in front of the world stage. We need more leaders like that. God is awesome in holiness. We serve a holy God. Jesus Christ is coming back, but he's coming back for a holy church. Matthew 25 and verse 5. But when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Uh, the new living. At midnight, they were roused by the shout. You see, the call will come suddenly. Do you want to be in bed with your boyfriend when that call comes? Do you want to be downloading porn when that call comes? Do you really want to be holding on to unforgiveness and bitterness when that call comes? Do you really want to be walking in a rebellious spirit when that call comes? Well, do you? In the eternal words of Clint Eastwood, do you feel lucky, punk? I'm just saying. I'm just throwing it out there. Because the call will come, and it will come suddenly. You see, there is such a thing as too late. Matthew 25 and 7. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone out to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who are ready, then those who are ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was locked. Later, when the other five bride, uh, bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So too, you must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. And I'm not trying to put out legalism there. I'm not trying to put fear in you. But I honestly believe there are people in church who are ready, and there are people in church who are not ready. They're not ready for his return. Amen. I don't claim to know anything about you today. I don't claim to know your past, your present, or your future. I don't know where you've been or where you are going. But I do know this one thing. You will not be ready if you do not live a holy life. Yeah, yes, pastor. But, but grace, but nothing. Amen. But nothing. Grace is an empowerment to live a holy life. Not a license to indulge yourself in sin. Amen. Hebrews 12, 14. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Do you know how many Christian men come to church that are bound by porn? This has to change. This has to change in Jesus' name. I want to see him for who he is. And I don't want anything in my life that is a stumbling block or a hindrance from me seeing or encountering him. How about you? Revelation 19.7 says, his wife has made herself ready. You know, anybody that is married knows it takes your wife a little while to get ready. But it's always worth it. Amen? All the guys said, thank you for that one amen. Um, a man ta was, was praying and he was thanking God for his wife. And he asked God, oh Lord, why did you make her so beautiful? The Lord said, so you could love her, my son. The man said, but why did you make her so stupid? So she could love you, my son. How many of you are grateful for godly wives, amen, even if it takes a while for them to get ready? And so too, after 2,000 years of the church, you might be tempted to despair, amen, because we're far from ready, but Christ is not finished with us. I believe he's about to do a quick work among us.
You see, the church is still his idea. It was birthed from his side as he hung there on that cross. So again, in spite of our failings and shortcomings, I believe God is going to have his way among us. He's working in us and he's working on us to create a bride without blemish. You know, Ephesians 5 talks about this, about uh, Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 26. Uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that she, he might present her to himself a glorious church. This is the end times church. It's going to be a glorious church. It's not going to be a church that's preaching veganism and feminism and environmentalism. And I had a very vivid dream last night. Uh, I, there was this church. I, I was standing in a church, but there was no worship. There was just an altar. And, and the man from the altar was saying, I hope you've all signed up for the Green Party. And I remember there was a huge angel at the back. And the angel just put his, his head in his hands. <laughs> that might offend you. Okay, I love the fresh air. But I'm not going to make a God of the environment in Jesus' name. R- Romans 1 talks about that. Worshipping the creature rather than the creator. Don't give something a, a place it should not have. God alone is the one we put on a pedestal. We worship him. Amen. We worship and honor him in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. This thing is becoming like a religion to some people. A church without spot or wrinkle in Jesus' name. But that she should be holy and without blemish. This is God's call for you. You are the church. You're called to be holy in Jesus' name. You see, Jesus said, I will build my church. If we let him, Christ will work his holiness in your heart. You see, every one of us are called to live holy lives because holiness is still God's standard and rule. Isaiah 35 8 talks about a highway shall be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. Amen? So again, the Bible talks about the highway of holiness. And we all know that a highway will get you to where you are going quickly and safely. But there are other pathways that you can choose that may ensure that you may never get to your destination. Uh, Pastor, we're we're moving in together to save money. You know, we're going to get married anyway, so what's the big deal? Um, I don't give because I don't really feel like I have to. Tithing is Old Testament. Um, you know, I've got the gospel, so God could really shut up shop for all I, I care. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to heaven. That's what matters. And anyway, I, I, I mean, I, I need to get the latest iPhone 11. And, and, and so that's why I, I can't tithe. I won't tithe. I mean, I can't be expected to support the church and wear all of the latest fashion now, can I? Early morning prayer. Yeah, that's like so Old Testament. Um, I have a prayer app instead. Yeah, it prays for me. Uh, But you can only get it on an iPhone 11, so I guess if you have a granny phone, you're going to have to keep like praying for yourself. (laughs) Pastor, I decided to go to a church nearer to me. What? Of course I didn't pray about it. I asked my feet, and my feet said, yes, let's do this. My feet said, you can have 20 minutes more in bed every Sunday. Let's do it. I mean, that has to be God, right? I mean, sure, it doesn't matter what church you go to. Once you turn up and clock your cards with God, it's not like he has a specific place for you to serve and to grow and to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, I know they say it's worth a drive for a, a church to alive, but I don't have a car. Nobody gave me one. I am so offended. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 Pastor, I would love to make church on Sunday, but I am going to be tired. You know, someone actually once said that to me. I mean, he had like scheduled it into his weekly plan that on Sunday morning, that's when I'm going to be tired. Okay? And... Uh, I mean, forget about 2,000 years of church history where, you know, believers gather together on Sundays in good times and in bad. This is a new enlightened generation. You see, the point I'm trying to make with all of these stories, uh, many of which are based in truth, uh, what I'm trying to say is the highway to holiness is just that. It's a highway, not a low way. 
You don't have to reach for something low, but you have to reach for something high. David said, I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Let me say this. The day of preaching a gospel void of sacrifice is over. You know why many times people follow all of these leftist ideologies? Why many times, you know, you see Christians converting to Islam and these other religions? Because there is an expectation placed upon them. If you want to follow, this is what you have to do. But we come into church and we want to wrap people up in cotton wool and avoid making people uncomfortable or offending them. And therefore we never say anything worth hearing. There is a move that, that is about to happen, I believe. There is a move that we can get into, but the same way as the surfer, he has to prepare himself for the wave. You have to prepare yourself for what God is doing, because what God is going to be doing these days to come is not going to be like what you've experienced in the past. We have to change, because the Bible says, I, the Lord, do not change. He doesn't lower his standards for anybody. I don't care what where our society is going. God's word does not change. Could somebody say, thank you, Jesus? It's a, it's a highway, not a low way. It may involve you at times being inconvenienced, challenged, or even embarrassed. What? You don't sleep with your girlfriend? Seriously? You tired? You mean you don't watch that show? You mean you don't go to bars and clubs? How, how are you expected to meet somebody? You need to drop your standards a little. Take a drink of this. It'll, it always helps me. No. Colossians chapter 3. We're called to live a holy life. Amen. Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised to Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not in the things of this earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we will also appear with Him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to uh, put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, put out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've uh, put off the old man and his deeds, and you've put on the new man who's renewed in the image of him who created him. So we're called to live a holy life. You know, for, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. You see, we're called to live a holy lifestyle. And, and again, maybe you're a new Christian. I want to clarify this. Doesn't, sex is good. It's a wonderful gift from God, but it's to be used within the boundaries of marriage. Fire is a great thing, particularly in this kind of weather. A fire in your fireplace is great. A fire on your couch is bad. There is a time and a place for everything. Sex, the Bible says, is reserved for marriage. We're called to live a holy lifestyle. Let me say this. There are no exceptions. It doesn't matter if it seems to be countercultural or weird, particularly to a generation that has literally tried everything. Amen. But we are called to walk in holiness, even if it means at times we walk alone. And at times you will. At times you will stand up. Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, their minds and their consciences are corrupted. You know, we read Isaiah chapter 6. What was the very first thing that struck Isaiah when he was given a glimpse of God's glory? One of the first things that struck him, uh, it says he saw the angel saying, holy, holy, holy. They didn't say power, 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 or prosperity, prosperity. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Let me say this. None of us are here forever. The time will come when we take our final breath and we will stand before our creator. And the first thing you must know about this God is that he is holy. He is holy in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. God is holy. And he said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The next thing that happened is Isaiah was convicted of his sin. 
Okay, so, uh, and, and Isaiah responds by crying out, Woe is me, for my, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That word undone in the Hebrew is dama, and it means to be dumb or silent. It means to fail or perish. It means to destroy. It means to cease or be cut down or cut off. It means to destroy, be brought to silence, be undone utterly. A modern expression might be to be speechless or if you're Irish, gobsmacked. <laughs> Isaiah was gobsmacked in God's presence. He, he just, he did not know what to say. Amen? So when is the last time you were gobsmacked or speechless in church? When is the last time that you trembled in God's holy presence? Because for Isaiah at least, there would be no return, amen, to business as usual. He would never be the same again. You know, he would forever be a God-marked man. Why? Because he'd encountered God in his awesome holiness. And dead religion or lifeless tradition or ritual could never satisfy the cry of his heart again. From that time on, Isaiah was marked. Psalm 99 verse 3. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. And yes, I understand that we are the righteousness of God. I, I, I agree that we are new creatures in Christ. But what I want to ask is, have we lost something along the way? Because when you see people walking into church with no sense of reverence and walking out with no sense of conviction. Amen? Let's be honest. You know, many Christians watch the same things as the world. In many instances, you know, we speak and we live in the same way. And yet we know in His Holy Word, it says, come out from among them and be separate. God calls us to be separate from the world. So why we obey, his, disobeyed, or ignored His command? 1 Peter 1, 15, 16. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You know, how many Christian homes obey this commandment? You know, we say that we're pro-life, and yet we watch people kill each other for entertainment. We watch movies where God's name is blasphemed, and where all that is good and that is holy is mocked. That's why I find it ironic that, you know, a, a media and a Hollywood uh, that celebrates and glorifies perversion and sin and, and under, does everything it can to undermine the family values and anything that is wholesome suddenly gets all self-righteous around President Trump. I don't buy that. There's an agenda at play. You need to use your brain. Don't listen to what those people are pumping out. You know, there's an agenda at play. Learn to think for yourself. But you know, when we, when we watch that stuff, our minds are being renewed just in the wrong way. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of you need to change the TV you're watching. Some of you need to change the, the film. Oh, well, pastor, I just forward the sex scene. Listen, if you're, if you're having to forward or if you're having to mute things, you're watching the wrong thing. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for that one. Amen. Um, but then, listen, we watch all that stuff and then we wonder why we can't feel God's presence in our lives. Really? I mean, you have adultery and perversion literally on tap in your home through a so-called entertainment package and yet you ask why you can't hear His voice or feel His presence. Maybe it's being drowned out by the noise of your irony alarm. Your irony alarm is beep, beep, beep. Because you're a Christian, you're meant to follow life and you're feeding on death. You see, we condemn the Romans for sitting in their amphitheaters and watching people kill each other for entertainment. But are we really any different? Some of you do it every night. God is calling for a people who are set apart in these final days. You see, the end times church will be a holy church. You know, Exodus 29 and verse 36 talks about it's time to cleanse the altar. You see, God wants to cleanse the altar in Jesus' name. He wants to cleanse the altar of your heart. He wants to cleanse the altar of the church. Because for too long, there has been sin and compromise. What was the first thing Jesus did when he went into the temple? He started to overthrow the tables and kick out those who bought and sold. Those who wanted the church to turn the church into a business, he rebuked them. Yeah, let me say this. This is not a business, even though there are business aspects to a church. You need to pay your taxes and have everything right. But I'm saying the church is not a philosophy. It's not an institution. It's not a business. It is His. It belongs to Him. It belongs to Him. The glory belongs to Him. And we must therefore be holy and deal with the things of God with a sense of reverence. 
1 Corinthians 10 and 20. Some of you saying, dear Jesus, when is this message ever going to be over? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hang on in there. We're nearly there. 1 Corinthians 10 20 says, no, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot partake in the table of the Lord and the table of demons too. Are we trying to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You might respond by saying, drink the cup of demons? No, pastor, not me. The issue that God is talking about, he's not talking literally, but rather figuratively. Because let me say this, when you see believers consuming filth online, downloading porn, watching you know films on netflix and others that are full of blasphemy and cursing and immorality cursing the name of jesus glorifying violence portraying homosexuality and sexual deviance you know uh, and deviance you know deliberately seeking to normalize that which god abhors let me say this i appreciate culture has changed his word hasn't changed god's standards hasn't changed what God calls sin is sin and will still be sin in 2,000 years time in Jesus' name. Amen. He's God, I, the Lord, do not change. So again, when we are watching that kind of stuff and taking that in, when we're, you know, in the name of entertainment, engaging in things that God condemns, you must realize there's a problem. Again, let me say Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. You know, surely this should be our desire. But it, this warning is recorded in his word for a reason. The truth is, many of us are way too passive with unholy thoughts, or unholy words, or unholy habits, attitudes, or influences. You know, Jesus rebuked the church in Revelations 2.20. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches my, my servants to sin sexually. So again, Jesus rebuked them, not just for what they were doing, but for what they were tolerating. What are you tolerating in your life right now? What kind of thoughts? What kind of attitudes? Maybe it's unforgiveness or bitterness or, or, or some habit that you have refused to deal with. And year after year after year, the Spirit of God has been dealing with you about that thing and you have not judged it. Know this, those seven churches are not there today. Judgment eventually came. I'm not talking about filling you with fear or anxiety, but I understand this. If you want to work with God, know this. The first thing you must understand about God is He is holy. And He says, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Could somebody say, thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Let me say this. Ultimately, what you tolerate, you validate. The sin you refuse to judge may ultimately become your epitaph. Yes. He was busted by lust. Yes. She was buried by bitterness. He was brought low by beer. The sin you refuse to judge will eventually judge you. Yes. John 12, 21. There were Greeks among them who went to worship Jesus. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and requested of him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. You see, like the Greeks, we all want to see Jesus, but there may be some things that are obscuring your vision of Him. You know, as a pastor, I've discovered that people are careful what they put on their TV when you call. I think it's funny. Yet, this is the thing. Christ dwells in your heart. He, he dwells in your heart and your home all the time. And some of you give no regard whatsoever to what He thinks about what you're viewing. You know, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 talks about the great falling away. And, you know, while some of us think that word falling away is the Greek apostasia, where we get the word apostasy. You know, apostasy is defined as departure, falling away, defection, revolt. So a falling away from truth. And, you know, when we think of apostasy, we might think of, you know, the radical departure from biblical belief. Um, you, know, the, you know, like heretical cults like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. But in truth, it also includes a falling away from biblical morality. And, and let me say this, there are many more believers who fall into that category. The cute Christian couple living together. The man looking at porn late at night. The person who gets drunk at the weekend to prove to his friends that he's still relevant. You know, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, 2, 7 and 8 talks about the mystery of iniquity is, is at work. And then that lawless one will be revealed. 
The Bible is talking here about the revealing of the Antichrist who is going to come. And we're seeing the, 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 the birth pangs of, of the manifestation of his kingdom right now in our society. We're seeing the birth pangs of that Antichrist kingdom. But again, we must remind ourselves, you know, that, that the word of God warns us about this. It says, uh, verse 3, let no one, 2 Thessalonians 2, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of uh, sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It's talking about the Antichrist. And verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will be taken away, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So again, if you're walking in lawlessness, that's the characteristic of Satan's kingdom, not God's. Amen? Uh, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Amen? So again, it's, it's speaking in very, very sobering terms here. Uh, and, and let me say this, that spirit of lawlessness and rebellion is already working in our media, in our schools, in our politics, in our colleges, you know? That, that spirit is, is working. And, and it says, then the Antichrist will be revealed. You know, the revealing of the Antichrist will be characterized by a falling away from truth and a falling away from morality. And we're seeing that right now. So again, we need to get right because let me say, Jesus Christ is coming again. Because you know, much of our entertainment is made by people who hate God and yet the essential characteristic of God is that He is holy. Amen? Leviticus 11.44, I'm, I'm just finishing. Uh, Leviticus 11.44, but I'm the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy uh, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with corrupting things that creep on the earth. For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus, Leviticus 19 and verse 2. And it says, every one of you, uh, it says, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Chapter 20 and verse 7. And it says, consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. You see, this is a command, not a suggestion. So again, we might need to realize the sin that we tolerate is still in our lives because we don't grasp how great our God is. The message is awesome God. And this may be hard for some of you to hear today, but the sin we allow to remain in our lives is still there in many instances years after being saved because we love it more than we love Him. And you're never going to be free until you acknowledge that. That's why some of you have stuff in your life and you know it's been there for years. And you pray and you pray and you pray and nothing is changing. Why? Because you love that thing ultimately more than you love God. So what are the things you're tolerating? What habits have you cultivated in your life? Godly or ungodly? What thoughts do you permit in your mind? But, but I can't help it, pastor. Yes, you can. Amen. Temptation might come, but you know what? It won't stay if you don't give it any place. Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. And that includes his dirty thoughts. That means you don't have to go to those perverted websites anymore. You don't have to watch those immoral films. You don't have to use that bad language. You are not a victim, so quit thinking like one. Uh, Romans 8, 27 said, uh, 37, we are more than conquerors through Christ who gives us strength. As the ushers give out the elements, I would like to finish today by taking communion together. Because as we do so, like I said, my desire in this message is not that you would walk out of here today full of condemnation, full of anxiety or, you know, with a renewed sense of legalism and I have to try harder. It's not about trying harder. It's about understanding that Jesus Christ took your sin on the cross so that you could be free. He broke every chain. He lifted every burden. And the Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The Lord loves you and He wants you to be free today in Jesus' name. You know, Exodus 28 and verse 36 says, make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten a blue cord to attach it to the turban. It is to be on the front of the turban. So that gold plate saying, holy to the Lord, would be positioned over the front 
of the priest's head. You see, God wants us to have pure minds. Amen. You see, our God wants us to have clean minds. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So today, I don't want you to leave here thinking that I, I have to try and do this in my strength. No. Victory is ours through Jesus Christ. That thing you're struggling with right now, Jesus defeated it at the cross. And the moment you believe that, you're going to walk out of that prison. The moment you believe that, those chains are going to break. The moment you believe that, that burden is going to lift from your life. You know, John Wesley was a man mightily used by God. You know, and, and uh, one of his favorite verses was um, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and verse 30. And it says, Christ has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You see, Jesus is our righteousness. He is our righteousness. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Do you know sanctification simply means to make holy? Christ is the secret to holiness. When you read the journals of, of John Wesley, you realize it's one of the most common verses that he preached on. He preached in Ireland many times. Many times he, he encountered very hostile crowds, not just here, but in Great Britain. But you know what? He kept pressing forward because he had discovered a secret to success in life. It's not about how hard we try, amen, or how good we feel. It's rather, it's about what Christ has done. Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption I don't know what you need today I don't know what's going on in your life I know this Jesus is the answer he is the answer to what you need in Jesus name Psalm 33 verse 8 let all the earth fear the Lord let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him my desire through this series is that it will bring us as the church back to the place where we rightly stand in awe of our glorious God. Where we stand in awe of, of the cross. Where we stand in awe of the cross and all that Christ accomplished for us there. And this is why I want to finish this message. By breaking bread together. Because you know the Bible says in Luke chapter 24 that after Christ had died the disciples were discouraged. They were afraid. They were anxious. Because the dream had died. Everything that they had based their life on, their hopes on, they watched it die as they saw Christ take his final breath on the cross. And here Peter and John are on the road to Emmaus. And suddenly they encounter Jesus. And verse, 20, uh, verse 25 says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the thing concerning himself. When you open this book, doesn't matter what chapter, what page, Old Testament, New Testament, ultimately you will find Jesus. You will find Jesus through the pages of this book. And Jesus, he preached about himself through Moses and the prophets. And it says, and then they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated he would have gone further. But they constrained them saying, abide with us for it's towards evening and the day is far spent. And they went, he went in to stay with them. And it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened when they saw, uh, when they, and, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? My heart's desire is that this message would play a part in causing your heart to burn again. That it would cause you, by God's grace, to begin to rid yourself of those things that are blocking your heart and are blocking the flow of his spirit in your life. And that your heart...